We know Adolf Hitler as the incarnation of evil. The architect of the destruction of Europe, the man responsible for the bloodiest crimes in history. He rose to power, portraying himself as the savior of the German people. But what lay behind this facade? In 1943, at the height of the war, the American Secret Service tried to get inside the mind of the Führer. They ordered a team of Harvard psychologists to put together a top secret psychological profile of Hitler to try and work out what he might do next. We want to know as much as possible about the things that make him tick. You're asking for something that's never been done before, Bill. Under enormous pressure, they poured through documents. We all know this isn't going to be easy. Track down people who knew the Führer. His long, sallow face was contorted, and tears flowed from his eyes. And argued about what it all meant. But you can't say that. All right, all right. They recorded every word of this investigation in detail. As you got older, infantile sexual feelings were probably quite prominent in this relationship. And what they discovered was shocking. He said she'd be glad to sleep with him if that was all he wanted. A disturbing cocktail of abuse, obsession, and sexual perversion. And on this basis, the American psychologists made a series of amazingly accurate predictions about Hitler's future conduct two years before the end of the war. Did that mean they had succeeded in getting inside the mind of Adolf Hitler? This man is Dr. Gerald Post. He is an internationally renowned expert in the discipline of political profiling. He has analyzed more political leaders than anyone else in the world. He worked for the CIA in the 70s, setting up their first publicly acknowledged profiling unit. This is it. Yeah. Fantastic. And the psychological profile of Adolf Hitler is where it all started. Well, in many ways, it's like the holy grail for my, uh, my field. Uh, this was really the very first uh, disciplined study of a political leader at a distance using a psychoanalytic framework and in many ways uh, was really the inspiration for the unit I came to uh, found at the Central Intelligence Agency. This is the first time that Dr. Post has had the original report in his hands, and he's never seen the more than 1,000 pages of the profile's background research. This isn't just an opportunity for Post to revisit the past. It's also a chance to see if the analysis of Hitler's troubled mind stands up to modern scrutiny. By the end of 1942, Adolf Hitler had only been in power for nine years. In that decade, he had transformed Germany, and his armies had swept all before them in Europe. He seemed invincible. defeat at Stalingrad in January 1943 signaled the beginning of the end for Hitler's dreams of a thousand-year Reich. In two years, it would be all over. Yet that's not something the Allies could have predicted in the winter of 1943. The temptation has always been there to look back at the war from 1945 backwards, and so 1942-43 seems to be the point at which the Allies took the initiative and 
gradually squeeze the axis until they had won. But if you stand in 1943, beginning of 1943, things look very different, very uncertain. German army is deep in Russia. Allied shipping is under severe submarine threat. In 1943, it was by no means certain that the war would be finished in two years. By no means certain the Allies would win. The Allies also feared that Hitler was on the verge of taking the war to another level. They knew that German scientists were developing the technology to launch missiles with the potential to deliver an atomic bomb. For the Allies, it's clearly very important to understand what makes Hitler tick, because this might be the man who finally says yes to biological weapons, or weapons of mass destruction, as we call them now. This is the man who might say, push on with the atomic weapon, weapons program. We'll drop an atomic bomb on London. You can't be sure, given everything that Hitler's done up to now, quite how this man is going to behave. In the early spring of 1943, Working out what Hitler would do next was a top priority for the American Secret Service. While Bill Donovan, the director of the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA, approached Walter Langer, a leading Harvard psychologist, and asked him to draw up a psychological profile of Adolf Hitler. Langer recorded the details of that fateful conversation. Relationship to the German people. We need something more reliable than what we get from the German propaganda machine as stuff our foreign correspondents feed us. What we need is a realistic appraisal of the German situation. If Hitler is running the show, what kind of guy is he? What are his ambitions? How does he appear to the German people? What's he like with his associates? What's his background? But most of all, we want to know as much as possible about his psychological makeup, things that make him tick. And we also want to know what he might do if things begin to go against him. Now, do you think you could come up with something along these lines? <laughs> You're asking for something that's never been done before, Bill. That doesn't mean to say it can't be done, and you're just the man to do it. Well, uh, that's very flattering, Bill, but I don't know how valuable it'll be. Why? Well, we'd have to get most of our information from the literature. And while that's extensive, for the most part, it's unreliable. Uh, furthermore, psychological and psychoanalytical techniques aren't designed for this sort of thing. Now, if anybody can make this work, it's you, Walter. Just give it a try and see what you come up with. Hire what help you need and get it done as soon as possible. And another thing, keep it brief. And make it readable to the layman. <laughs> This was the public face of Adolf Hitler. He'd risen to power in the 1920s when the country was on the verge of economic and social collapse. He pledged to revitalize and rebuild Germany. And this was a message that the German people were desperate to hear. For Hitler, there was a very real, uh, almost lock and key fit between his own psychological needs and the needs of the damaged German uh, populace. They each gave to each other uh, something that made this more powerful than either the leader or the followers independently. 
For a long time, historians were prone to see Hitler as an aberration, um, an extraordinary Pied Piper who suddenly turned up in Germany and played his pipe and the Germans followed blindly behind him. Almost all the recent history, though, of the Third Reich has shown the extent to which Hitler, in very important ways, represented much of German society, represented German values, that he was leading a nationalist revolution as much as causing one. And I think that that's made it possible for us to place Hitler more realistically in the context of German history and not to see him as some kind of alien figure who was suddenly foisted onto German people. By the mid-1930s, Hitler had established his dictatorship, systematically dismantling German democratic institutions. What Langer was looking for was the private man behind the public face. He was trying to find the deep roots of Hitler's rages and hatreds. Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's great. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Under enormous time pressures, he needed help. He put together a small team of psychologists and researchers. We all know this isn't going to be easy. All we're going to get is a mass of raw material. It's been gathered from innumerable sources. None of it's going to be first-hand and none of it's going to be obtained under the controlled conditions of personal psychoanalysis. We can't put Hitler on the couch. Furthermore, it's almost a foregone conclusion that a lot of the information we're going to dig up is going to prove to be untrustworthy and irrelevant. It's a challenge. But we've got no alternative. Now, tell me about your mother. All of this research was analyzed through the lens of Freudianism. The business of psychology has boomed in the second half of the 20th century, spawning a panoply of different analytical approaches. But in America, in 1943, one particular version of Freudianism dominated, a version which placed heavy emphasis on childhood experiences. It seemed like mom spent most of her time helping dad with his business. I guess she didn't have much time left over for me, even when I was sick. For Freud, the personality was constructed in childhood. This, for him, was the crucible where all humans were made. The problem for Langer and his team was that Hitler had been very careful to virtually obliterate his past they'd very little to go on. What they did know was that Hitler had three brothers who all died young and two sisters. They were also aware that his father was a drunken brute who beat the young Adolf regularly and, for Langer, that would almost certainly have a significant effect on Hitler's psyche. Under such circumstances, the child becomes confused and is unable to identify himself with a clear-cut pattern that he can use as a guide for his own adjustment. Not only is this a severe handicap in itself, but in addition, the child is given a distorted picture of the world around him and the nature of the people in it. The void is created in childhood. It represents what we've come to call the, the wounded self. Uh, and in, in uh, Hitler's case, we really have to go back several generations to be understanding uh, what was uh, so troubling uh, to this man. He described a very sadistic father, uh, Alois, 22 years older than his mother, who was violent uh, with the children, uh, would beat the dog uh, and, until it urinated, uh, at one point left Hitler for dead after a savage beating. Langer suspected that Hitler's abusive father would drive him into the arms of his mother, which would have profound psychological consequences. Langer was presented with an opportunity to test this theory when he tracked down the Hitler family doctor in New York. His name was Dr. Eduard Bloch. He was Jewish and had escaped from Austria when the Nazis annexed the country in 1938. 
Did Hitler have any medical problems? Oh, I only treated him for minor colds, uh, 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 of course, measles. <laughs> he was a weak child. But he had no physical deformity, uh, um, and definitely no tuberculosis, although tuberculosis was uh, hereditary in the family from the father's side. Well, I suppose if that's the case, you can't have known him very well. On the contrary, I was the Hitler family doctor. I, I got to know them uh, all very well when I was treating his mother for uh, breast cancer. I gave her an injection every day. What was Hitler like with his mother? Well, uh, I have to say that uh, the relationship between a mother and son, uh, their um, reciprocal adoration, was unusual. How did this manifest itself? When I summoned Hitler and his two sisters, uh, who were married, they didn't live at home, um, when I summoned them to my office to tell them their mother was gravely ill with no hope of recovery, his reaction to this news was touching. Uh, his long, sallow face was contorted, uh, tears uh, flowed from his eyes. The girls, on the other hand, received the news uh, with calm, uh, reserve. Only then did I realize the magnitude of the relationship that existed between mother and son. When his mother finally died of breast cancer, Dr. Bloch was amazed at Hitler's reaction. In the practice of my profession, it is, of course, uh, quite natural that I uh, should have witnessed uh, many scenes such as this one. Yet none has left me with quite the same impression. In all my career, I have never seen anyone so prostrate with grief as Adolf Hitler. His mother would turn in her grave if she knew what he turned out to be. For Hitler, his mother's grave became something of a shrine. There's evidence in one of the many home movies shot by Hitler's lover, Eva Braun. This one shows Hitler, Eva, and some friends on a trip to Leonding, where the Fuhrer grew up, and the site of his mother's grave. Her son covered the tombstone in Nazi icons and memorabilia. Eva took no moving pictures of Hitler at the graveside, but there are a series of telling still images. Every scrap of evidence indicates there was an extremely strong attachment between Hitler and his mother. This was due in part to the fact that she had lost two or possibly three children before Adolf was born. And since he too was frail as a child, it's natural that she'd do everything in her power to guard against the recurrence of her earlier tragedy. And the result was that she catered to his whims, even to the point of spoiling him, and that she was overprotective in her attitude toward him. For Langer's team, Hitler's infatuation with his mother and loathing for his father was a perfect fit for Freud's famous Oedipus complex. Uh, life with his mother must have been a veritable paradise for Adolf, uh, except for the fact of when his father would intrude and disrupt the happy relationship. As he got older, infantile sexual feelings were probably quite prominent in this relationship. This is the Oedipus complex. The more he hated his father, the more dependent he became upon the affection and love of his mother. And the more he loved his mother, the more afraid he became of his father's vengeance should he be discovered. Every little boy, as he is uh, desperately wanting the total love of his mother, comes to see his father as a rival. This, however, can be particularly powerful if you have had an overly attentive mother, as Hitler did, and an abusive father, as Hitler did. 
But with that abuse of authority, uh, there is on the one hand the wish to get rid of him, but on the other hand the fear of his power, uh, which is represented in the so-called castration complex. For a Freudian like Lange, this extreme castration anxiety could manifest itself in adulthood, in the fear of syphilis. Freud even had a name for it, syphilophobia. Throughout Mein Kampf, he comes back to the topic of syphilis again and again, and spends almost an entire chapter describing its horrors. In almost all cases, we find that a fear of this sort is rooted in a fear of genital injury during childhood. Lange continued to examine Hitler's childhood through the lens of Freudianism. I mean, this is, we're doing as best we can with what we have. For the father of psychology, there were five clearly delineated stages of growing up. And what Lange was looking for were signs that one of the stages had gone wrong. Because, according to Freud, if they did, there would be profound psychological consequences. Dr. Bloch provided corroborating evidence for this theory. Uh, Hitler and his mother lived in um, a rented uh, apartment. It was a small place, rather poor. My uh, predominant impression of this simple furnished apartment was its uh, cleanliness. Oh, it, it glistened. Uh, not a speck of dirt on the, um, the chairs or the tables, uh, not a, a stray fleck of mud on the scrubbed floor, not a smudge on the panes of the windows. Frau Hitler was a superb housekeeper. Hitler's mother's obsessive cleanliness was significant for Lange. It indicated that the toilet training phase of Hitler's childhood might have gone wrong. Now, you can't say that. All right, all right. Well, how about this? From what we know about his mother's excessive cleanliness and tidiness, we may assume she employed rather stringent measures during the toilet training period of the children. We know this usually results in a residual tension in this area. It's regarded by the child as a severe frustration that arouses feelings of hostility. Now this facilitates an alliance with his infantile aggression that finds an avenue for expression through anal activities and fantasies. These usually center around soiling, humiliation, and destruction, and form the basis of a sadistic character. Aber dass die Partei weiterleben wird, das weiß ich, und dass über alle Personen, über Schwach und Stark hinweg, die Zukunft der deutschen Nation erfolgreich gestalten wird, das glaube ich und das weiß ich. Lange felt that he had a potential fit for Freud's Oedipus complex and extreme difficulties with the toilet training stage of childhood. And he suspected that this would be most clearly seen in Hitler's attitudes to sex. Sex, for Freud, was crucial to what drove and determined people. And in Freudian analysis, an anally retentive personality might well appear apparently disinterested in sex or asexual. According to the man who ran the Berghof, Hitler's stunning Alpine retreat, Hitler and his lover, Eva Braun, were never physically intimate. My wife was always very curious, as was I, and she often did Hitler's washing. And the first thing she always did was to check if there had been any sexual activity. But there was never any evidence. My wife checked the sheets and there were no signs of sexual activity, none. And if we had private conversations with the chambermaids, they said the same. No traces could ever be found. Lange didn't know this at the time, but he did know that Hitler was awkward around women and appeared to be asexual. This reinforced his belief that the Fuhrer had something to hide.
I think it's important to think of individuals in layers. There's the layer we see on the surface, which for many is all that is seen and understood. And for many leaders, that layer is there to overcompensate for what is missing beneath. For Hitler, the magnitude of his weakness psychologically led to a drive psychologically to overcome that, and he developed this um, compensatory messianic self. I am a Jugend. But again, that's a surface picture on top of uh, this empty self beneath, this wounded self from that rather cruel childhood. But Lange didn't believe that Hitler could keep this weak, empty side of his personality permanently hidden. Following his version of Freud, he knew where to look. He suspected that it would express itself sexually. He was most interested in Hitler's relationship with his niece, Gili Raubau. There was speculation in the Hitler literature that he was more than just an uncle to the teenager. He couldn't talk to Gili because she had committed suicide in 1930, apparently following a row with Hitler. But Otto Strasser was close to Hitler and Gili during this period. He was one of the founding members of the Nazi party, along with his brother Gregor, seen here alongside Hitler at a party rally in 1927. But they both fell out with the Führer over the political direction of the party. Hitler later had Gregor murdered, and Otto escaped to Canada. You knew Geely Raubel. Yes, I knew her very well. I took her out a few times. And how did her uncle Adolf react? He got very jealous when he found out. He finally forbade me from having any further contact with Gelly. Did you see her again? Yes. One morning, she appeared at my apartment in Munich very upset. I let her in and tried to quieten her down. But all I could get out of her was that she didn't know what to do with her uncle. What did she mean? Well, she said that Hitler was very generous with her in some respects. And very harsh with her in others. And he frequently locked her up for long periods of time. Because she refused to do what he told her. And what did you say? I said to her, why don't you just sleep with him? What difference does it make if he's your uncle? What did she say? She said she'd be glad to sleep with him if that was all he wanted. But that she couldn't go through another performance again. I asked her what she meant. But well, she wouldn't tell me. I kept on asking. And finally she gave in. What was the nature of this performance? Well, she said that Hitler made her undress while he lay on the floor. Then she would have to squat down over his face while he examined her at close range. And this made him very excited. When his excitement reached its peak, he demanded that she urinate on him. And that gave him his sexual pleasure. Gelly said that she found the whole performance extremely disgusting. And although it was sexually stimulating for Hitler, it gave her no gratification whatsoever. The Strasser evidence is hard to judge. There's no doubt that there was no love lost between Otto Strasser and, and Hitler. He is not, in that sense, an impartial witness. Um, and the other problem, of course, is that we need a great deal more evidence 
which is going to be very hard to get, to be certain that the thing he's saying is not just one of those titillating rumours which people spread about about Hitler and all the stuff about Hitler's homosexuality and so on, his sexual perversions. This was, this was a kind of libel, if you like, which was more widespread in the 1930s, perhaps, than we might realise. What's interesting about Strasser's material is it served to confirm analytic hunches that Langer had. It made sense psychologically. In the act of, uh, of being subject in his perversion uh, to being uh, really uh, sexually humiliated by a woman, uh, that represented the unmasked wish to surrender, capitulate, be seen as a weak man against which he was forcefully uh, quarreling psychologically and in his power, the power of the will. This was central for him. This was the highly potent, powerful leader. But underneath that, um, underneath that was this man who was desperately weak uh, and desperately afraid and uh, and afraid of, and yet seeking submission and capitulation. Langer believed that Hitler found a way to deal with the terrible psychological consequences of his perversion. By adapting a political ideology which was a prevalent and powerful part of mainstream European culture. Anti-Semitism. Hitler's outstanding defense mechanism is one commonly called projection. It's a technique by which the ego of an individual defends itself against unpleasant impulses, tendencies, or characteristics by denying their existence in himself while attributing them to others. From a psychological point of view, it's not too far-fetched to suppose that as the perversion developed and became more disgusting to Hitler's ego, its demands were disowned and projected upon the Jew. At this time in 1943, Langer had no idea that Hitler's anti-Semitism would create the horrors of the Holocaust. For Langer, Hitler's hatreds were driven by fear and insecurity. Yet the Fuhrer appeared to possess an almost superhuman self-confidence. The explanation for this apparent contradiction, once again, lay in Hitler's childhood. As Dr. Bloch confirmed, Hitler was a weak, frail little boy. But there was one thing that marked him out as special in his family. He survived. His three brothers didn't. They all died young. And that allowed Langer to make an important clinical deduction. The thought of death is inconceivable to small children. But in Hitler's case, it was a living issue. And the fears of his mother, that uh, she might lose him as well, were in all likelihood communicated to her. And what does this mean for Hitler? Well, in his immature way, he probably wondered why the others had died while he continued to live. And it is natural for a child to draw the conclusion that he would be favored in some way, or that he was chosen to live for a particular purpose, that he was under divine protection. This is what Freud called the Messiah complex. There's no question that Hitler believed he had Christ-like qualities. It's really very important to understand uh, Hitler, the Messiah, Hitler, the, the savior. Indeed, he relished when people say, Heil Hitler, the savior of the German people. And he identified, in fact, with Christ, but not Christ the nurturing, loving Christ that we know of, Christ the fighter who had to fight against the Jews to keep from being destroyed. Langer wanted more time to finish his profile. 
But Donovan and the Secret Service pressured him to complete the report. So, five months after he started, Langer had to commit everything to paper. After analyzing Hitler's character, he made a number of startling predictions. He said that as the war went against him, Hitler would become more neurotic and his famous rages would intensify and become more frequent. He also predicted that there would be an assassination attempt by the disaffected officer corps. A year after the report was completed, von Stauffenberg, a colonel in Hitler's staff, tried to murder the Führer by placing a bomb under his table at his Eastern Front headquarters. The bomb blasted room where an explosion nearly got Hitler. Seized Nazi film pictures the scene. German generals plotted to kill the arch war criminal and make peace, but Hitler was late in arriving here. And in the bomb burst, he was only injured. Hitler survived, and von Stauffenberg and the other plotters were rounded up and executed. But Langer also made a number of more psychologically profound predictions. His public appearances will become less and less because he is unable to face a critical audience. On the face of it, this prediction seems illogical. Hitler exploited the propaganda benefits of encouraging a cult of personality. It might therefore seem reasonable to expect that when the country's back was against the wall, he'd be out rousing the troops. In fact, Hitler did the exact opposite. He became more reclusive, just as Langer predicted. On the other hand, Winston Churchill made a point of being visible when the war was going against him. I think it's really quite important to distinguish Churchill from Hitler psychologically. He had the capacity to rouse the nation at its darkest hour, but never seeing the, uh, such a total identity with the nation that a, an attack upon the nation diminished him. And what we saw with Hitler, who was carrying within him this messianic self-concept where it was history had written uh, his role to be the most important leader in the world. When evidence started coming back that was undeniable that this was not to be, that the tide had turned, this was quite shattering for him. Because don't forget, that messianic self-concept was the compensatory overlay for the profound void within. Langer was convinced that the conflict would culminate with the complete destruction of Germany. There would be no surrender, no peace negotiations. The course he will follow will almost certainly be the one that seems to be the surest road to immortality, and that, at the same time, wreaks the greatest vengeance on a world he despises. final months of the conflict, Hitler made it known that total destruction was the Allies' only option if he was to be defeated. Langer's prediction that, that, that Hitler will bring Germany crumbling down ar around him does, of course, turn out literally to be right, because in the last weeks of the war, Hitler issues his famous scorched earth um, directive, where the party and the military have to destroy everything. The Allies mustn't get anything. Uh, it doesn't mi he doesn't mind now about the German people. The German people will starve. I mean, they've let him down. Um, in this sense, I mean, this is, this, you know, Langer is right, that here is somebody who, who only really thinks in black and white, life and death. And, and if, you, if you lose the struggle of the races, if you lose the struggle for existence, you don't deserve anything else. Um, now, whether this is something driven by 
the nature of Hitler's own psyche, whether this is something which would only have happened with him and not with somebody else. Well, that's probably right, but then nobody pretends that Hitler was in any sense a normal politician. Langer then made a final prediction about the fate of the Führer. From what we know of his psychology, the most likely possibility is that he will commit suicide. It's probably true that he has an inordinate fear of death, but being a psychopath, he could undoubtedly screw himself up into the Superman character and perform the deed. Remarkably, Langer made this prediction two years before the war ended. The bunker where Hitler ranted and raved in the final days of the conflict is long gone. It was here that Hitler took his own life. With the Russians swarming all over Berlin, he sat with Eva Braun, who he'd finally married the day before, as he bit down on a cyanide pill. He simultaneously shot himself through the head. His body was carried out into the bombed out garden, doused in petrol, burned, and then buried. And Langer is spot on in this case. I mean, that, 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 you know, this, is, this is a suicidal personality. Um, he's not somebody who's going to simply give up, lay down his arms and say, OK, let's have an armistice. One of the most fascinating predictions to me uh, is the manner in which Hitler would bring his end, uh, namely uh, that he would suicide, which was uh, uh, an uncanny psychoanalytic intuition. If you take this notion of the empty self, which has built up this compensatory, grandiose, messianic facade, what happens when that facade is shattered? It's totally intolerable. Uh, and, uh, and this is really, I believe, what Langer was, was uh, conjecturing, uh, that if uh, his dream of total glory, of total power, uh, were to fail, uh, and uh, that facade of grandiosity uh, was to shatter uh, underneath this, that empty self would emerge. And that was intolerable for Hitler, and he had to kill himself rather than be confronted by this total shame and total humiliation. The fate of this top secret document is shrouded in mystery. We do know that it reached the highest levels in the British Foreign Office. But there, the trail runs cold. Langer was absolutely certain of the value of this profile and the profiling of political leaders in general. In fact, he went so far as to claim that things might have been completely different if the Allied leaders had the report before Neville Chamberlain tried to appease Hitler when they signed the Munich Peace Treaty in 1938. I would like to believe that if such a study of Hitler had been made years earlier, under less tension and with more opportunity to gather first-hand information, there might not have been a Munich. Munich gave Hitler a chunk of Czechoslovakia in return for peace. But Chamberlain completely underestimated Hitler's appetite for German expansion. We regard the agreement signed last night as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Historians are far more cautious about the value of this profile and the whole discipline of psychobiography. There are so many other factors that have to be brought into this. There are so many other um, political, diplomatic, military and strategic calculations. So much of this is entirely unpredictable. The war in 1939, for example, Hitler thought he was just going to be fighting the Poles. All along he thought he wasn't going to fight Britain and France. And suddenly at the last minute the crisis becomes a crisis of European war, not just a crisis of war between Germany and Poland. So even understanding better what makes Hitler tick 
would be very difficult, I think, for either the people around Hitler to act differently, or indeed for the British or the French or the Poles, perhaps, to have acted differently as well. Dr. Gerald Post has no doubts about the value of psychological profiling. In my strong belief from the very early days uh, in, in founding the Center for the Analysis of Personality and Political Behavior is our leadership needs nuanced political personality profiles of every important world leader, but particularly those leaders who really threaten us. Walter Langer's work predicted the end of Adolf Hitler, but he had no idea that he'd started a whole new discipline in the CIA, the science of the political profile. We must understand the leaders we're contending with. You can't deter optimally a leader you don't understand. And to relegate, be it a Hitler or a Joseph Stalin or a, a Saddam Hussein to a, a crazy evil madman really degrades our capacity uh, to uh, deal with them optimally because we're not thinking about what pushes them, what, what makes them tick. The government of the United States agrees. Since Dr. Post founded his unit, the CIA has profiled every important world leader, up to and including Saddam Hussein. Be sure to be watching this time next week for our exclusive coverage of the IAAF World Athletics Championships live from Osaka, Japan and support our Australian team in bringing home the gold.